Hey everyone, you may have noticed I have my mic mounted on the other side of my desk right now, or not if you don't pay that much attention. The reason for that is because I'm not using this monitor today. Today I'm using the big LCD program monitor over here because I've got my Tandy hooked up and working, and that's the only monitor to work on right now. It won't display to this one because this one won't sync low enough. Right now the video output is this bizarre Bula Boss of adapters where it goes out the back of the machine into a CGA to RGB adapter, then from there into a VGA to DVI adapter, and then from there into a DVI to HDMI adapter, and from there it splits, and then one feed goes to the program monitor, and one goes to my capture card. It's it's working pretty well, well enough anyway. You'll actually get a clearer picture than I do, because I have not yet gotten a display here that works well uh, with this type of machine. But it works well enough that I can show you what I want to show you, and I've already found some utility software for this that I like. So let's go ahead and get into it. So first, I'm just going to go ahead and fire up the Tandy so you can see what it looks like when it boots. It's really unusual. And we're booted. This is actually completely started. And the reason for that is that the version of DOS that's loaded right now is actually in ROM. It's not on a floppy, it's not on a hard drive. This is in a ROM chip that's actually soldered to the board or socketed. And it's DOS uh, 2.11. So this machine can't not have DOS. It'll always have DOS, which is fantastic because you don't have to always swap a DOS disk into it in order to start it up. And you don't have to swap a DOS disk in every time you exit a program that's taken DOS out of memory. So that's a really cool feature. In addition to that, it boots up into this cute little program here uh, it seems a little weird, but what it does is it provides a shortcut to Deskmate, which we'll see in a minute, and then View Programs on Drive A and Drive B. Let me show you what that does. I'm going to put a disk in. See, when you run that option, it indexes the disk and it pulls out anything that's executable, and it just makes you a cute little list here. Now, if I'd had a disk in when the machine booted, it would have actually checked that right away. So it would have booted straight into this and show me what was on the floppy disk. This is a silly little feature, but tell me, why didn't other machines do it? Every single copy of MS-DOS could have come with something this simple in it, and it would have been just, just that much nicer to use your computer, right? Anyone could do better than what we got. All right, anyway. We're here to talk about Deskmate. So, Tandy Deskmate was sort of a pack-in office suite that came with Tandy computers. So I don't have the original Deskmate discs because they're long gone and finding Tandy software actually on the original media is very expensive these days. Everybody on eBay wants exorbitant prices for this. So what I did instead is, of course, I jumped online and got a disk image and just wrote it out. By the way, if you look at these discs, you'll notice they have a piece of tape on them. Now, the reason for that is that these are some high-density discs that I got. Now, floppy disks come in three varieties. Uh, SD, if you will, although it's really just original floppy disk. Those are 360 kilobytes. And then double density, which is 720 kilobytes. And then high density, which is 1.44 megabytes. Most of the floppies you've seen in your life were high density, and the way you can tell is because they have both of these little windows, one here and one here. Now, every floppy disk has this window. That's the right protect window. But floppies that have this are high density floppies. The Tandy 1000 does not have a high density drive, and it cannot have a high density drive. Not this model, anyway. I think maybe the later ones can do it, possibly with an extra piece of hardware. But the actual disk controller in the machine only speaks double density and single density. So that's it. 720K is all this machine's ever going to read. In fact, the original Tandy 1000 EX only had a five and a quarter inch drive, and I'm actually sort of angling to get one of those so I can put in some of these five and a quarter discs that I have over here and run them on native hardware. The only difference between a 720 and a 1.4 meg disc in practice is what's actually written onto it. But the drives always use that little window to decide if the disc is the right format. Now this machine doesn't care, but I wrote this disc image out using a USB floppy drive on my Windows 10 desktop machine. There's no way to tell that in software, hey, this is a 720K disc. What you can do though is you can just tape over that hole and then the drive will read it and go, this is a 720K disk when it reports to the operating system. 
you do that you have to look up an arcane format command to get it to format the right number of tracks but once you do that you get a 720k disc just fine so i just copied the files onto it and here we are so the disc i've put in the drive right now is deskmate 2. so the original deskmate was black and white this one's color i'll show it to you in a second but i did want to establish the distinction here this one here is labeled personal deskmate now there's a difference between the two the tandy 1000 hx actually shipped with personal deskmate the one I'm going to run on here is actually an older, crunchier version of it. The problem is, this one requires a mouse to use properly. So I'm going to show you a little bit of it, but I can't show you the whole thing because I don't have a mouse on here right now and they're very hard to get at the moment. So I'll go ahead and fire this up so you can see what we're looking at. All right, so this is Tandy Deskmate, and right off the bat, this is kind of a weird app for DOS. Very few applications really have this kind of desktop interface to them, which I, you know, it's the idea. I mean, you might not see this as a desktop interface in the style of Windows, and that's fair. This one's pre-mouse, but if you look at it, this is a landing page. It's a, a gateway through which we can get to lots of other things. And if you haven't picked up on it yet, all the columns in the middle here are a navigable interface where you can select from different parts of an office suite. Text is a simple text editor. Worksheet is an Excel style spreadsheet program. Filer is a little strange. I haven't figured that one out yet. Uh, telecom I don't understand entirely because uh, it requires you to have a modem and to dial up to something. Uh, calendar is exactly what it sounds like. Mail is a little weird, but it is in fact a mail app. So we'll start with text. So. You can select any one of these empty fields and it'll kick you into the program. And as far as I can tell, the principle here is that once you actually save a file, all the files that are on the disk take up this space here. And the top one is always an empty row, so you can make a new file. And that applies for all of these. If you pick that top row and press enter, it'll make a new file. So we'll start here. Now, right off the bat, it asks you for a file name, and that's because these programs operate with this strange kind of implicit saving functionality. There isn't really an approach to leaving these Office programs without saving the file. It just assumes that you want to save. I'm not actually sure how you get rid of a file at all. Maybe you have to do it from the top level. So let's make a new file. Okay, so now we're in a text editor. This is a very bare bones text editor because there wasn't really much you could do at the time. There was no way to have italics or bold on the screen. And this program isn't made for doing high quality print documents. So you pretty much just have a character cell editor. Of course, at this point, I don't believe DOS even came with one. So this beat the hell out of nothing. So you'll notice down at the bottom, we do have options for find, uh, substitutes. That's obviously find and replace. The uh, F3 switches between add and replace, which is the difference between overwrite and insert so in replace mode it'll overwrite letters when i type over them uh, in add mode it will insert in the middle of them now normally you could just hit insert for that but on this machine apparently you can't do it there's a format option but all that actually does is let you change the line width so if we set that to 25 characters and then we start typing when we reach the end of the line it'll wrap around at only 25 characters. We can also go back to that, set the number of columns back up to 79, and it'll rewrap it again. Fortunately, the home and end keys work, so you can get to the beginning and end of a line easily. And this also has the ability to select, copy, cut, and paste text. However, in order to do any of that, you have to start digging into the help file. So that's where things get a little more unsettling if you're used to old software. You would think F1 would get you into the help file, but this is not the case. You have to press Alt F1. And here we have a convenient online help. So obviously this tells you how to use the basic features here. F7 will allow you to start doing a copy or delete operation. So that's how you start doing block select. So let's try that out. I'm going to go to the middle of the line here. I'm going to press F7. Now, you would think at this point that you would press F8 to copy the text, but that's not the case. If you do that, it's going to try and copy that text and save it into another file. Instead, what you want to do is to press F5. So the term clipboard, I don't believe existed at this point in time, maybe on the Macintosh, but on the PC, it was not well accepted. However, the term buffer, I think, had come over from Unix. So now I can insert it by pressing F10. 
So now that we're done, how do we get out of the program? So you'd think that you could press escape, maybe, but no. Uh, you'd think maybe F11 or F12, but those don't work. No combination of Control q or Alt-Q or anything works. Instead, the way you exit this program is by pressing Alt-F10, the least intuitive shortcut I've ever seen in my life, and it implicitly saves. I don't know if there is a way to exit a file without saving the file. I have not yet found a method for it. I guess that's just the way the cookie crumbles in this office suite. So now that we're out here, what we should be able to do, however, is to select that file and delete it from here. And it looks like we can do that. There we go. Let's go over and check out Worksheet. It's going to immediately ask me for a file name. I'm going to make this test two. It picks its own extension automatically, invisibly. And so here we are looking at a text mode spreadsheet. I believe this looks a lot like VisiCalc, although to be frank, I never used VisiCalc. Now, problematically, I also don't understand the formula language for this, and I've not yet gotten a reference guide for it. So this program is fairly limited compared to Excel. I'm not sure how it compares to other spreadsheet programs available at the time, because this is really my first time using an old 80s spreadsheet app. So unfortunately, I might not be the best tour guide here, but anyway. I looked up some information on how this works from the manual that came with the computer, and it's not very good. First, it gives a very, very, very simple spreadsheet layout for summing a column with no controls other than sum everything above this line. Then it gives you a lone amortization calculator, which, by the way, is why I flunked out of the one and only college course I ever took, because I could not understand lone amortization. So being that the two things in the book are one that's nearly useless and one that I don't understand, I can't demonstrate the full power of the spreadsheet. But I can show you a little bit. It's a spreadsheet. So obviously you can enter numbers, and it turns them into decimal notation, because this is money we're working with, and this program is for money because spreadsheets are for money. And then if we come to here and do sum r1, then it fails because I forgot to hit formula. Let's try again. Sum R1. Now you'll notice the field's just empty. And the reason for that is that live recalculations of fields would have been too expensive on a processor of this era. I have to tell it to recalculate by pressing Shift F1. Notice how long that took. When I edit these fields, they will not update the number in real time. I have to manually recalculate it each time. My understanding is that that was typical for spreadsheets of the era. There's also a notation for referring to a column and row, which is R1, C1, or, you know, R30, C30, whatever. And that's about it. That's all I can really show you with this program. So again, in order to exit, we do Alt F10. The next program here is Filer. This one is basically a very small database app. So it's going to ask us for a file name. We'll put in test1 as usual. And now it presents us with a form editing interface. So I'm going to make a form here. So the way you do that is, you name the field, press enter, you just press enter again, that's it. And the next one, repeat. Okay, now we're going to press Alt F10 to save the form. There we go. And now we are in the database editing interface and we can now add data. I've just entered a record here, I'm going to press F10. Now we have a blank record. And now we've just entered a second record. So now I'm going to go ahead and exit this. So that was the add record interface, and now that I've exited it, I'm now looking at the view record interface. So by pressing control left and control right, you can skip back and forth between the records in the database linearly. You also have the ability to use find, you can press F1, and then you can search based on the contents of any field. So I've entered personal and then a wildcard, and if I press Alt F10, that'll kick me back out to the record view mode, but now it's filtered to only the records that matched that term. So if I press control right or control left, it'll just skip me between the two records that contain that term. If I press F1 again and then press F5 to reset, then Alt F10, that'll get me back into the original view where I can see all records. If we press F3, that will display all the records in the database just based on their first line. And then from there, we can select one in order to print it. Since I have no printer, I'll skip that. Pressing F5 will take us back to the form editor. I don't know what the effect is on existing data if you edit this. And then the other options are the same ones that are in all the other Office Suite programs. Merge, Select, Copy, Delete, and Add. I don't exactly know what Merge would do, and I don't have another database to merge with. Let's actually go back 
make another database that's completely incompatible, and then see what happens if we try and merge them. Alright, now we'll exit this, and now let's attempt to merge. Merge from test 2. Alright, well it seems to have done something, let's see what. It seems to have stuffed the row into the middle of the database, not the beginning or the end, and just thrown away some of the data and kept what was in the right place. So that's terrible. Now to the best of my knowledge, there's no way for me to not save this file now, because the only way I have to exit is to hit Alt-F10. I'm going to try Alt-F11. Didn't work. Alt-F9? Nope, that seems to... Well, Alt-F9 gave me something special and interesting. It changed the bar to let me know what the other Alt shortcuts are. So this is where we find out that there's a calculator you can get to from anywhere. 35, F1 for add. I guess we gotta press the button in order to push it up the stack. Is it a stack? Oh, okay, it's just an adding machine. Oh, okay, and we can just change the mode. All right, that's cool. We hit Alt F10 to get out of that. Alt F5 takes us to phone. And presumably that's some modem, but whoa. Okay, for a minute I thought these were real, but fortunately they're all just 555 numbers. Anyway, so, I mean, clearly this is a contact list, and it looks like you can have this thing place calls. Now, I don't know anything about what telephony was like, but apparently modems could be used to just plain call a number. I, I don't know. I never had one that could do that. Alright, so let's get back out of this. And you can just do that in the middle of another task. It'll let you just bail out to that and then come back when you're done, so that's cool. There's also an option here for printer. I'm guessing that lets you select a printer. Oh, the printer settings. Okay, cool. Uh, and then we have the ability to uh, change the date right here from inside the program. Anyway, but with all that done, we still don't have a way to exit without saving. So I guess I'll just have to save. Next program is going to be Calendar. It does support maintaining multiple calendars, which is cool. All right, so we currently have the first selected, because that is the day of the month that it believes that it is. It also thinks it's January 1980, which definitely predates this machine's existence. So I'm going to press F3 for events, and now it'll create a new event. I'm going to let it be on today, and it begins at 8 p.m., ends at 9 p.m., and the description is shooting this video. Now, as you can see, it's actually blocked out time on the weekly view above to show me which hours are gonna be unavailable on which day. So that in itself, super fucking cool. If I press F10, it lets me add a new row. So now I'm going to set an event on the third, and now it's blocked out that time. So as you can see, this is honestly, for text mode, this is kind of a beautiful calendar app. Like it, I don't know what else you want. If we press F5 on an event, it's now merging the events into an alarm file. And that's all it did, so now I have to bail out. As you can see, it has imported that calendar event and shows me that for today I have an event at 8 p.m. So now I'm gonna press F4 for alarm. All right, now obviously this came with a bunch of preloaded items, but you can also see that it pulled in the entry I put in. Not all of them, just the one that I had selected when I hit F5. That makes sense. You wouldn't want to import your entire calendar into alarm events. So there is a reminder set at 7.30 by default. I could change that to whatever I want, but it automatically made it 30 minutes before the beginning of the event. So with that done, I can now exit this, and now from anywhere in the system that alarm should go off. Now I've never had the alarm go off. Let's just go ahead and update this one so that it goes off at what it thinks is a couple minutes from now. Now I'm going to go to the Alt F9 menu. I'm going to go to Alt F4. And now in the far upper right, you can see the alarm is on because there's an at symbol there. So now we're just going to wait one minute. There it is. Was that it? That's all the alarm we get? Wow, that was a really lame alarm. That wasn't good at all. It was bad, actually. Final application is going to be mail. And notice I already have some stuff here. It's kind of strange and I'll show you what I mean. I think I know what's going on here and we're going to test it right now. So this is the mailbox and there's nothing here so I'm going to hit create to make a new message. It's going to be from Mark description hi Mark to Jonathan. Now it takes me to a letter writing interface. I should note by the way I'm not going to fix any of those typos because this keyboard is actually very unpleasant to type on. Not because the buttons are so bad. They're okay. The problem is that caps lock, shift, control, and alt are in completely wacko bizarro land positions. So if you're used to a modern or even a late 80s IBM keyboard, this one will throw you for five loops. So I'm going to save this letter. Okay, now there's nothing here. Go open another level. And all of a sudden, we have a new mailbox for Jonathan. And if we select that, here's our letter from Mark. And there's our letter. We can print it or whatever. 
There's no automated method for replying to a message. You can just create a new one. So what I think is going on is... Several of the things I just said on the camera were bullshit. So it turns out, based on the help file, I, so it turns out, based on the original documentation, that this button down here, host, is actually a button that turns this machine into a server. So now, anybody else using Deskmate could theoretically dial into this thing and leave messages and do other stuff. And I haven't quite figured out everything they're supposed to be able to do yet. But apparently, this thing has networking. Now that's pretty fucking cool. Unfortunately, I can't demo it because I don't have another Tandy 1000, but I'm probably going to end up with one. See, in order to get parts of these things, at this point, you're pretty much down to scavenging for them. So I have to order one on eBay and then scavenge the cards out of it in order to get a RAM upgrade, because otherwise it's impossible to get a RAM upgrade for these. They're completely unique. So if I'm going to have a second one, I might as well use it for some wacky-ass 1986 client-server communications bullshit. So once I have an opportunity to do that, uh, I'll be sure to make a video about it. But for now, we're done demoing Deskmate 2. So I'm going to show you briefly what Personal Deskmate looks like, because it's a very different beast. My understanding is that Personal Deskmate was what this machine was supposed to either ship with, or what they sold for use with it. I don't have the exact timeline, because the Tandy 1000 is not really as well curated as a lot of other machines from this era, and certainly machines from subsequent eras, and certainly machines that were less tedious, and certainly machines that were for video games. So because I don't have that information, I'm not 100% sure if this is what you were supposed to have as an out-of-box experience on this machine, but my understanding is that Tandy did intend this to go with the 1000HX. So right away you can tell this is a very different beast, and the most important distinction is that this is a mouse-driven interface. I don't have a mouse for this machine because it takes a serial or a bus mouse, neither one of which I have any way to connect to this. It has no serial interface, and I don't have the bus card for the mouse. Fortunately, they provided uh, quite a bit of keyboard accessibility, probably understanding that this was not going to be something everybody had. So I can go ahead and arrow around here, and each of the menus has an access key. This is a beautiful interface if you ask me. This uh, aesthetic is absolutely wonderful. So I've just launched the calculator. On the desktop there's a little calculator there, but I guess this is a more advanced calculator. I suspect that's like a receipt tape on the right. Let's find out. Yeah, it sure is. And by default it just enters things. Probably have to hit plus. There we go. And then you can do repeating sums and whatnot. Probably press escape to exit. Okay, so I've actually been poking at this for a bit and I cannot figure out how to exit this program. Tab won't move it, escape won't move it, F10 doesn't, Alt F10 doesn't, break doesn't, nothing will get me out of this app. All right, so I had to reboot because I couldn't get out of the calculator without a mouse. So I think that really establishes how critical mouse is to operating personal deskmate. I just don't think it'll work correctly without one. I'll show you a little bit more before I shut it off though. I've already checked and found that I can't use the music or paint tools because I don't have enough memory. I have not tried the text editor yet. Let's take a look at that. I adore this icon, this rune that shows up. It's wonderful. So this is our text editor and clearly quite a bit fancier than the old one. There's a lot more data on the screen because it's running in, as I understand it, running in a higher resolution. Again, I don't know that I can actually reach every part of the UI without the mouse. Seems like I probably can't. A new upgrade is that you can just hold down shift to mark text. And then it looks like under here, I can actually set text modes, although they don't render on the screen. That would only apply if they were actually being printed. Let's try the underline. Well, the underline does actually work. And then we can use play to just erase all settings that have been applied to that text. So this is this is pretty self-explanatory. I do notice that from this app, we have access to this menu, sort of a start menu. And it looks like these are probably quick ways to get to the desktop items, so you don't have to leave the program in order to go use them. But let's try the notepad. I'm not sure what swap means. I'm going to try that. It does not exist. Let's try create. I've written some text, and it looks like this program does actually support tab correctly. So I can just hit quit. That was pretty successful. What else do we have in here? We have access to a clipboard, and I wonder if that's a multi-page clipboard. Hmm, it doesn't look like it. Let's go ahead and copy some text into the clipboard and see how it renders it. There it is, just some text. You can't do anything with it, but there it is. Another thing we can do from here is we can go to a couple of control panel items. These ones down here at the bottom. Color, for instance, allows you to change the color scheme. Because this is Tandy Graphics, it gives us access to all 16 entries in the CGA color palette on screen at the same time, so we can combine these any way that we like. I'll show you a scheme that I put together earlier that I thought looked good. I find this one fairly pleasant to look at. 
And it looks like just like that we can go back to editing our document. The old format option has been replaced with page setup, which I suspect to be more sophisticated. Oh, and it is. Quite a bit, actually. It looks like we can do either portrait mode or landscape mode, and we can also do columnized text. And of course a whole bunch of other page settings. I'm going to try column mode. So this is not a what you see is what you get editor. So consequently, despite the fact that it's showing that it's going to print two columns on the final page, it won't show that to me. Instead, it's showing me the width of one column, and I just have to understand that this will wrap as needed. That's fine though. It was a lot to ask at the time to do any better than this. So now when we quit this program and ask if we want to save changes, uh, mark an improvement over having to save changes in the old desk menu. Notice that the notepad from the desktop has the text that I put into the notepad when I was in that program. So it looks like that's just a scratch pad where you can store whatever you need. Let's see if we have enough memory to load a worksheet. Nope, not enough RAM. Let's see if the filer will operate. Nope, not enough memory. So it looks like I can't actually run any of the programs other than the text editor because I don't have enough RAM for it. That's not really surprising to me. I'm surprised anything worked. This machine only has 256k of RAM. There's a couple other miscellaneous features up here in the menus. We can do directory management. We can get info on the current disk, format, or copy disks. There's this menu I'm curious about, build. I'm not sure what it does. I'm gonna hit create. Oh, okay. This allows us to make a menu, I think, up on the menu bar. Let's find out. Well, I'm not sure what it did. Nothing seems to have changed. Well, I'm not sure what I did or what I did wrong, but I've deleted my calendar, and I have no idea what that menu does. Let's consult the help file. If I press F9, it does give me access to a help file. Oh, this is tedious. This is tedious. This unfortunately is quite a grind, which I'm not up to at this late hour. So we're going to go ahead and say goodbye to Tandy Deskmate for now. My review of it is cool. What a really neat suite. That is really killer. To get a computer at the time that this came out that had all those things built into it and didn't require you to do anything more than just turn it on and immediately have all these different utilities at your fingertips without having to swap out disks and learn the names of programs from the command line and everything. I don't want to say that it would have made them highly competitive in a market that had a lot of clones operating in it already, but it seems pretty clever to me. I wasn't there at the time. These don't look like very good versions of this software, but I also don't know what else was available at the time. I'm fairly certain that the text editor, for instance, was probably competing with WordPerfect. My understanding is that WordPerfect was amazing. Certainly a higher grade piece of software than Tandy Deskmate Writer. So I know it would have been nice to demonstrate more of that software. Unfortunately, I'm not sure if we'll ever get a mouse and RAM for this machine in order to run everything that's in there. So in the interest of getting something up about the software instead of nothing, I opted to go ahead and put up what I could. I hope you had a good time, and as soon as I get more Tandy software in the future, I'll be sure to be shooting videos of that as well. This is definitely an interesting machine for me, and I'm really looking forward to all the stuff I'm going to get to go through on it. That includes games, and I have a couple of joysticks coming in the mail, specifically for the Tandy's unique joystick ports. Unfortunately, I'm not sure how many games I'm going to be able to run unless I can scrape up a RAM card for this thing. If you happen to know anybody who has one, let me know. Drop me a line in the comments, and we'll make arrangements. I'd be willing to pay for one as long as I can get it reliably. Anyway, thank you very much for watching, and hopefully you'll see a lot more of this machine in the future. Have a great night.